What's that sound? Can you hear that buzzing sound? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Seriously, there's buzzing everywhere. Perhaps this is a case for... Investigation Ouch! Yes, this is a room full of flies. And no, I haven't had a bath in weeks, but we're not going to talk about that. If you're wondering what these flies have to do with modern medicine, I'm about to tell you. This is Kerry Jones, and he's a fly breeder. Yes, you heard right, he breeds flies. Kerry, how many flies have you got in this room? We've got 36,000 flies in this room. Do you count them all? Every single one. And I bet he knows all of their names. What kind of flies are they? They're the common green bottle, same as you'd find in your house or your garden in this country. But these flies are growing up in a completely sterile, bacteria-free environment, and they're eating a very special dinner. Mmm, yum. What we've got here is a big box full of flies eating raw liver. Disgusting. But there is a point to it. Why? The reason we're feeding them on raw liver is to build up their strength so they've got enough strength to lay the eggs, because it's the eggs we're interested in. Flies lay eggs, and the eggs hatch into larvae or maggots like this one. Hello, beautiful. And it's the maggots that have a special medical use. But before we get to that, those eggs have to be harvested. It's basically a manual process of removing the eggs from the liver. They're extremely small, and there will be between 10 to 20,000 eggs in each dish. Yes, this white stuff is thousands of eggs all stuck together. How long has this piece of liver been in there? Yeah, about two hours. So in two hours, 600 flies have laid 20,000 eggs. Yes. That would be impressive if it was chickens, wouldn't it? <laughs> And these fly eggs, little worm-like larvae hatch, these are maggots. Nice. Now, you've probably seen maggots before, and these are the same scary maggots that you see in dead animals and in horror movies. <coughs> but there's one really important difference. These maggots are sterile. These are superhero maggots. Being completely germ-free means they can be used in hospitals for a very important job. To clean dead skin away from large wounds, allowing them to heal. So these are... Nice maggots. Kind of. In here, there's a foot with a wound with 500 maggots in it. Let's go see them in action. Not if you're squeamish. Prepare to look away, but not yet. This is Ros Thomas. She's a foot doctor or podiatrist, and she's going to be tackling this. It's a foot with a nasty wound on the bottom of it and a sock, so it's still all right to look. Maggots have been on the wound for two days, and now it's time to see what they've done. Get ready, people. Hopefully they've had a good feed now. Hopefully we'll see a nice, clean wound. Prepare yourself. It can look a bit icky. And there we go. Are you looking? Cleaned up quite a bit, not completely. And they're still quite lively there. They're our little blind, legless surgeons that help to clean up all the mucky tissue. So they're very precise surgeons? They're very precise surgeons, yes. Take a closer look. Although they can eat dead flesh, maggots don't have any teeth. They vomit powerful chemicals onto the wound, which dissolves dead flesh, and the maggot can then eat that, along with any bacteria that are around. And that is what makes them perfect wound cleaning machines. It's looking so much better than it was originally, because it was completely covered with yellow mucky tissue. Yes, it was, but that yellow tissue was all dead flesh. So although it might look worse now, are you still looking? In fact, it's much healthier. This patient's wound has improved a lot in two days. But don't worry, the maggots won't eat the healthy flesh, only the dead stuff. No one's going to be eaten alive. So that's a relief. We normally think of maggots as eating rotting things in bins, but it's this ability to just eat rotten flesh that makes them such good healers. Whereas a human surgeon might have to amputate a foot, 500 blind, tiny, legless surgeons are able to eat only the dead flesh and therefore save the foot. We'll never hold back in showing you gross stuff. So prepare your eyes for blood-sucking gross stuff. This is Investigation Ouch. This is a leech, and it's a type of worm. Whereas we only have one brain, a leech has 32. And while we have 32 teeth, a leech has 125. Their main diet is blood. And in fact, right now, I'm providing lunch for this one. Whilst it's on my arm, it's going to eat five times its own body weight in my blood. That's the equivalent of meeting a small cow, hooves and horns and everything. It's not just greedy, it's disgusting. But these wrigglers can actually save human lives, all by sucking our blood. 
To get drinking, this leech has bitten me, and now its saliva is working its way into my veins, releasing a chemical which will thin my blood, preventing it from clotting. And it's this ability to get our blood flowing that surgeons use in modern medicine. So let's say you chop off the end of your finger. A surgeon can attach the finger, but if blood clots have formed inside the bit of dead finger, new blood can't get in and it will fall off. What doctors can now do is attach a leech to the tip of the finger, and the same chemicals that allow my blood to flow into the leech on my arm dissolve the clots and allow fresh blood to enter the reattached finger. There's no fancy machine or drug that can do this job as successfully as a leech. And with such an important medical role, leeches are bred on a massive scale. So while this one has a good feed on me, let's go and meet some more. This is Carl Peters Bond. He's a leech breeding king and is currently housing 30,000 of these wrigglers. How do they breed? Well, the leeches are a male and female, so they can fertilise themselves. Sort of boys on one section, a girls on the other, and then they sort of breed together. So when two leeches mate, they both get pregnant, which is pretty extraordinary. And wait till you meet their babies. This is a leech nest. When the leeches lay their eggs, it looks just like white form, and then it settles down to a sort of a sponge. So this is made by the leeches, and you can just see the clear space at the top, and then the leeches have settled to the bottom. I'm just going to cut the lid off. It is full of wriggling leeches. This is like the world's worst Easter egg, isn't it? Yeah. That's so fascinating, I'm completely distracted from how disgusting it is. And I'm completely distracted with the fact I've still got this enormous leech feeding off my arm. What's going to happen when he's full? Uh, well, it's just going to drop off, and then the hole it makes will just keep oozing blood for 10 hours. 10 hours? Great. No one told me that. That would have been nice to know. Well, after an hour and a half on my arm, it's finally full. And you can see how it's got the blood in my arm flowing. This is the point. If you've cut your finger off, if the surgeon's reattached the finger, it's the chemicals that are now making me bleed that allow new blood vessels and new blood to flow into the reattached finger. They may be greedy, they may be frankly disgusting, but it is that that means they are the most amazing healers. And you can see how much it's grown. It really is five times bigger. I look quite attached to that, literally. Ouch. As a doctor specialising in tropical medicine, I'm used to working in some exotic locations with dangerous creatures. But today, I'm on the top floor of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And in fact, this is one of the most dangerous locations I've ever been in. Because on this floor are 180 of the world's deadliest snakes. There are many species of snake here, and each one is capable of delivering a potentially life-threatening dose of venom, a poisonous fluid snakes inject through their fangs. Now, if you're wondering who on earth would volunteer to work with these deadly snakes, meet Dr. Robert Harrison. Why are you keeping 180 venomous snakes in this room? We take venom from these snakes, and that venom is used to make medicines to treat people who would otherwise die from snake bite. That life-saving medicine is known as anti-venom, and it's actually made using the snake venom itself. The anti-venom medicine Dr. Robert and his team are helping to make in Liverpool is used to treat people 4,000 miles away in West Africa, where there are 36,000 deaths every year from snake venom. Meet Paul Rowley, an expert snake handler who's brought some snakes out of their habitat for us to see in action. Well, this is the Nigerian sawscale viper, and it's the, um, amongst the most dangerous snakes in the world to man. Even though they are small, they are an extremely dangerous snake. They do kill a lot of people. Because anti-venom medicine is made using snake venom, Dr. Robert and Paul have to collect that venom from the snake's mouth. But it's a dangerous business. When the snake bites the dish like this, the poisonous venom drips out of the fangs and is collected. It's a bit like milking a cow, and it doesn't hurt the snake. And, Rob, what would happen if, instead of a glass dish, this was human flesh? Once it gets into the blood, it causes terrific bleeding throughout the body. The poor patient is just bleeding from everywhere, from the nose, from the gums, from the eyes, and internally. For such a little snake, it can cause a lot of harm. And this small drop of venom that we've just collected is more than enough to kill a human being. But it's also enough to make the anti-venom that will save people's lives. If you're squeamish, look away now. 
This is a 12-year-old boy who was bitten on the foot by a Nigerian saw-scaled viper. He lost his big toe, but the anti-venom saved his life. Each snake has a different type of venom and needs its own anti-venom to be made. So, ready for another? This one is seriously fantastic. This is a Nigerian puff adder. The snake has just bitten the mat, and that's just one of the problems of, of doing this, is this is a very, very tricky thing to do. This adder's venom has a different effect on the human body to the previous snake. Terrific destruction of the tissues around the bite. It just destroys the, the muscle and the skin. So this venom actually dissolves flesh Absolutely. and then it spreads around the body and, and then it spreads around the body. Yeah. This is a seven-year-old boy who was bitten on the hand by a Nigerian puff adder while he was cutting grass. The venom caused blood-filled blisters to erupt, but he made a full recovery thanks to the anti-venom. But not all snakes release their venom by biting. This snake is extremely quick and it can spit its venom. And that's why it's called the spitting cobra. In fact, it can spit as far as two metres. And if it was to get in your eyes, it could blind you. So Dr Robert's got his face guard on, and I'm staying well away to let the experts collect the venom. Ooh. You're just milking the venom glands there. Just massaging the venom glands. Now, don't worry. It's highly unlikely you'll ever need the anti-venom being made here. We don't have any snakes like that in England, do we? We don't. We're really lucky we don't have anything like the, the cobras or the, or the puff adders and things like that. But we do have the British adder. And it it's, is actually a really quite important snake. There was a, a near-death case two years ago. So I... when you're going out, just stay clear of these snakes. Don't handle them. Don't touch them. Leave them alone. Rob, I think after today, that advice is extremely obvious. I'm going to stay well back. <laughs> <laughs> that was spectacular. And remember, the venom that Rob and Paul risked their lives to collect today in Liverpool will be used to make anti-venom, and that will be used to save people who've been bitten by snakes in Africa. Ouch. It might sound ridiculous, but so is six months old, and Josephine, who's nine months old, are already brilliant in the water. In fact, humans are born with the ability to swim. No one has taught these babies to swim underwater. What they're doing is totally instinctive, and it's helped out by something going on inside them called the mammalian dive reflex. You have this reflex too. And so do sea mammals, like these seals. They can stay underwater for an impressive 30 minutes. Humans, though, lose this reflex by the time we're six months old. But some extraordinary people train themselves to use their mammalian dive reflex into adulthood. Today's brilliant body belongs to George Miller, the six-time national freediving record holder. Freediving is swimming deep underwater while holding your breath without any breathing equipment. George's body can do this because she's trained for 11 years. So prepare to be amazed but please leave this kind of diving to the experts. How long can you hold your breath for? I can hold my breath for a little bit over seven minutes. That is completely crazy. Do you think you could get me close to seven minutes? <laughs> Eventually. Maybe not today, but we can definitely improve you. OK, fantastic. We're going to see how long you can hold your breath for. OK. This will give George an idea of how well Zand uses his lungs to breathe. You did 1 minute 27, which is amazing for the first time. Impressive, Zahn. I'm quite pleased with myself about that. I think we can do better. Really? Yes. Freedivers learn how to use something that we call a three-part breath, a diaphragmatic breath. So if you put one hand on your tummy and one hand on your chest, the first part of the breath comes from the belly. And then the chest. And then just let it all fall out. So hold your breath. The trick is to use your diaphragm, the muscle under the lungs, to take in as much air as possible before you hold your breath. You did 2.17. Really? That's amazing. So that's almost a minute more. Yeah. So Zahn's got the breathing technique down. Now he needs to do it while freediving underwater. That's safe. 
safety is the most important thing, and I can only do this because I'm surrounded by professionals. So never, ever practice on your own, even in the bath. Before he goes underwater, Zahn uses George's deep breathing technique. His mammalian dive reflex is triggered once his face touches the water. How long was I under for? You were down there for 30 seconds. But for that 30 seconds, I was like a seal. <laughs> Zahn held his breath longer on land because when swimming in water, his muscles needed oxygen. But practice makes perfect. OK, here we go. Instinctively, Zahn's body knows he's not breathing, so it prioritises sending blood to his brain and his heart. This allows him to swim even deeper Amazing work, Zant. Dive two was a massive improvement. Seven metres down, 41 seconds. The most amazing thing about today is that what George has been able to show me is that my body is capable of doing things that I had no idea it could. And that's all thanks to the mammalian diving reflex.